Welcome to Chat with the Lawyer. I'm your host, Walla Blagay, and today we're here with Miss Yaida Ford with the Ford Law Firm PLLC. And today we're going to talk about a very important topic employment issues with federal with the federal agency and as we know there are so many federal workers thousands of federal workers in the Maryland Virginia and DC area and we have an expert that's going to give us advice on how to address those issues employment issues and even talk about some of her very important cases that she has right now with federal employees welcome Ms. Ford thank you for having me Walla all right, so tell us how you got into this practice. Um, well, my father is a federal employee. Um, he is a forest supervisor for the United States Department of Agriculture. Um, and I never, you know, we never had any discussions around the dinner table about me getting into this area uh, of law. Uh, but it came along um, probably 18 months into my practice. And really, it started with private sector um, workers. The federal stuff came because we got referrals. Uh, from my father and um, we started taking those cases on and the first case that we had in fact was a class of black firefighters in Washington State. Um, I'm barred in DC Maryland and I'm barred in Washington and so we took this case on it was it started out with uh, the, a crew boss and then it expanded to about seven plaintiffs and I think a lot of people don't know but the Forest Service when you see these these fires out on the West Coast, the Forest Service has firefighters that are specially trained to fight these wildland fires. And so these wildland firefighters go through the Forest Service to get their training, um, and they're certified to fight that. So when you call 911, the, the real experts that are going, going in to these forest fires are Forest Service employees, they're federal workers. Interesting. And tell us um, the context of the case. Was it an employment discrimination case? What was going on? Well, the, uh, the, the crew boss is uh, based out in a, a town called Darrington, Washington. A lot of these uh, you know, Forest Service workers are in rural areas. Okay? Mm -hmm. So um, he created a pipeline for diversity into the Forest Service's fire organization. So what he wanted to do was go into inner city Seattle mm -hmm. and get recruits. So go to places like Renton and Kent and bring in African American men and just people of color and women. Um, and uh, the Forest Service has a history of discrimination against women um, and minorities. Mm -hmm. And um, the black farmers litigation, there's just a long history there with the Department of Agriculture discriminating against um, people who pay taxes. Um, and so what this uh, gentleman was trying to do was create a pipeline to diversify the organization there, particularly in Washington state, which is less than 1% black. Mm -hmm. um, so when he uh, recruited these, these young men from inner city Seattle, they um, came to Darrington, which is the, the local town where they're being trained, and there's a bunkhouse there, and um, they were immediately harassed by the other trainees, um, just fellow crew members, um, being called black monkeys, um, niggers, um, just asked really offensive questions. Like, and this was you, during the working time? This was during work hours. This is while they were training. Uh, to become wildland firefighters. Um, you know, ask really offensive questions like, do you, you know, drink grape soda and why do all black people eat fried chicken? Um, one of the crew leaders, because the every crew, crews are about 19 to 22 people and each crew has like crew leadership. And one of the crew leaders asked uh, one of the African Americans whether he was there for a career or whether he was just there to get new rims for his car. So you, there were just very loaded um, stereotypes. And that's something that, you know, when you're in that kind of environment, this is a 24 seven job when you're fighting fires. Right. Um, and um, there's also an element of trust. The firefighters have to be able to trust each other when they're out there on the front lines because it's a very dangerous job. And um, just the environment was hostile from day one for a lot of these recruits, but they didn't know their EEO rights. Um, and it, it finally exploded when the, some text messages were discovered between a crew leader and another crew member. And the crew member uh, said that they wanted to go on a shooting rampage mm -hmm. um, targeting the black crew member. So it was very, um, when the text messages were discovered, it was the middle of the season. Uh, they were getting ready. Actually, I'm sorry, it was the tail end of the season. They were getting ready to go on another tour of duty uh, to fight their last fire. And the, the text messages were forwarded to uh, the crew boss, who happens to be African-American. Wow. Um, and it, and one of the messages actually said that they wanted to uh, put uh, saline, like Visine, um, in his water bottle to poison him. That is so it, outrageous. Yeah. Um, so it really, as you can imagine, um, 
there was kind of a, an explosive feeling in that in that team. There was no way they could go out and fight another fire together. And what management ended up doing was just disbanding the entire crew. And keep in mind that the crew was designed to diversify. It was designed to recruit minorities. And instead of dealing with the issues and the people who were sending the violent text messages and the death threats and all of that, management would just rather get rid of this. Um, and there's a culture um, in the federal government, but particularly in agencies like Department of Agriculture, and there are others who are notorious for, for just racism and discrimination, but particularly with Department of Agriculture, a culture of protecting um, the people who are uncomfortable with um, diversity, who are um, uncomfortable with tolerance and inclusion, and just getting rid of the problem. And sometimes, you know, on these agency side, on the agency side, management sees the diverse people as the problem. You know, if we never had these folks, we wouldn't even have these issues. Matter of fact, if they weren't on the crew, nobody would have called them a black monkey. So let's just let's, let's just, just keep them from here, and then that way we're good. Pretty much. I mean, that's the easiest way to deal with it. I mean, it, I think it's very uncomfortable, even in 2015, for most people to talk about race and inclusion and treating people equally. Right. And it, the problem is amplified in parts of the country where it's only 1% black. So who's right. going to stand up for who? Right. Um, and so we, I was very shocked. Um, this was our first um, major federal worker case. And I was very shocked with the way the agency management responded to uh, the allegations. It was very, the text messages were black and white. Well, this is overt discrimination. So were you able to settle this case? Uh, we settled five, the first five uh, very quickly. And then we're in the process now of settling the crew boss. And uh, there was a white plaintiff too. Uh, one of the white crew leaders stood up for some of the African Americans and he was targeted uh, as a result. He was retaliated against. Okay. So he's also a plaintiff. So we're in the process. Uh, the, the ink has not dried. As a matter of fact, we haven't even signed yet. Um, but uh, I, the agency ha obviously sees the desire to resolve these cases. But, you know, you can resolve a case, but then there's still the culture. And the question is, OK, agency, how are we now going to deal with this culture of discrimination and, and literally protecting people who are doing this and targeting minorities? All these men want to do is work. And in this economy, you know, if it's my house burning down, right. I don't care who's putting the fire out. I don't care what color right. he is. Right. I don't care. And so, you know, these are men and women who want to put their lives on the line. Mm -hmm. And on the on the female side, it's very egregious as well, because um, there was a case um, out of, I want to say California, where the it was a female plaintiff. She was a firefighter, Native American uh, woman, and the fire boss spit in her face. Mm -hmm. um, it was while she was out there um, on the front line, um, and she was sexually harassed. Um, she was called a whore. Um, and, you know, th these men and women who are putting themselves, they're already in a dangerous, it's a dangerous field. Mm -hmm. um, but then to be confronted with very bitter, very um, egregious uh, discrimination just because you are there, um, it's, ve it's very hard to deal with. And she was alone. She was one of the only women on that crew. I want to say she was the only woman on that. And how crew. much was she able to settle for? Um, you know, that, that's actually a private. I'm not sure of the exact number. The case did settle, but she also had to quit her job. They would not allow her to continue working for the agency um, and get the settlement. So, you know, and, and we don't agree to that in any of my cases where we can. You know, the, the, the person needs to keep their job. They shouldn't be, you shouldn't have to choose between standing up for your civil rights and working. Right. Now, start us off with the process, because in many cases, you don't have this overt discrimination, or maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> you can tell me. Um, and especially in this area where there's even more diverse um, diverse wor workforce in the federal government. So now if someone just feels discriminated against, what, what, what's the steps in the um, federal government? Well, the first step um, is to understand your rights, in, in, because the timing is so tight and for federal workers. It's not like private sector cases. And for a federal worker, from the time the discrimination happens, you have 45 days to file a complaint with your EEO counselor. Um, and the agency has an obligation to let you know who that person is and to let you know the steps and how to file, but it's 45 days. And that includes weekends and holidays, so there's no exclusion calendar there. Days. It's 45 calendar days. And that, you know, you can blink in 45 days is that. Um, so it's very important for a federal employee um, to not be intimidated by the process, um, to not wait too long. Um, one of the things I say to uh, plaintiffs all the time and potential clients when they call us is to document everything. 
Right. You know, if there's an email, if somebody said something to you verbally, respond with an email saying this was your understanding of that conversation. Um, because that's, it, it's really hard for plaintiffs in, in this judicial landscape that we're in. Mm -hmm. When you bring an employment discrimination case, it's very difficult and the burden of proof is very, very high. Um, so for, I always encourage people, document everything. If you had a conversation with somebody that you couldn't capture in an email, go back, write it down, and keep a log of those dates because the agency is going to look for when that, the, that date happened. And so if you can't get some claims within that 45 days, that claim may get kicked out. You won't, basically, before you get to the EEO judge or by the time you get there, the agency will have removed some of those claims um, from what the EEO judge will hear. Doesn't mean you can't bring up past acts because there is, um, you know, in the, in the federal employee context and even in the private context, you can talk about a pattern or practice of discrimination that's been happening, um, but the particular claims that you will get relief on. Um, it's very important that you bring those claims within the statute of limitations, which again is 45 days um, no. in most agencies. Can you go straight to the EEOC or do you have to go to the EEO office? If you're a federal worker, you go through your agency and then the agency, it, it's not, you don't go to an EEOC, um, like the Baltimore office of the Maryland EEOC. Go through your particular agency and that's, you know, they have an EEOC process. And so you have to use the agency's internal process for your claims to be actionable later on. Now, what do you say to many employees would say, well, I mean, the EEO person probably is, goes out to lunch with a lot of the, my supervisor, and can I, I mean, I don't want to go to that person. Um, you know, unfortunately, it's, and, and it really depends on how the agency is set up. Um, some agencies, the EEO office is separate from your particular location or where you work. It can be in another state. I know with really large agencies like the Department of Agriculture, uh, the, if the cases happen in Washington or California, their EEO office may actually be in Atlanta um, or, or in Albuquerque. And we get to know some of the EEO counselors well because we've represented a number of workers. So um, I would definitely say consult with an attorney if you're feeling scared. Um, sometimes you know, people go to their HR person or the employee relations office, and most agencies do have that. And, and in a lot of cases, we hear complaints about the employee relations office um, and not properly informing um, employees about their rights, um, which happens. You know, agencies don't have an incentive to, to help you file a complaint against them. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, but I, I still consult with an attorney right away, but make sure the agency has a, an obligation under law to educate empl uh, employees about uh, the EEO process. So before you can go straight to court or go to dis you know, federal court, if you're a federal employee, uh, the federal courts have jurisdiction over your claims. Before you do that, you have to go through the internal um, agency process first. Wow. Well, this is good information. We're going to take a short break and we're going to come right back and go through the rest of this process and some of the other cases that you have. So as you know, this is good information, so please stay with us. Thank you. Welcome back to Chat with the Lawyer, and I'm here with Ms. Ford, and we're talking about the rights of federal employees in employment. So we're going to go right back into it. So now the employee went to the EEO office, and the EEO office did their investigation. And tell us about the investigation process with the EEO office. Do you know a little bit yeah, about no. that? So um, once you file um, the um, initial, what's called an informal complaint, um, there is a, a process, but most of the time um, the agencies will offer an early resolution, either ADR or some type of mediation, and that is supposed to be accomplished within the first 90 days, typically. Um, and Should the employee engage in that? Or? You, you know, I think it's worth it. Um, I think it's worth trying. Definitely if you have counsel, we, we like to utilize the ADR process because a lot of people just want to get this behind them. Mm -hmm. I think with plaintiffs, they go through stages. Mm -hmm. At first, it's like they're so pissed off mm -hmm. that they want to go straight to court, right. go as far as you want to go. But then, you know, as time um, progresses and some, some people get battle weary. Um, there's, and there's something in them that says, you know, let's try to settle this if we can. Mm -hmm. So we'll use the first 90 days. We always elect it. And I tell people, don't 
is always elect to do that. A lot of employees who represent themselves in the beginning make the mistake of not wanting to do it because they think nothing's going to happen. Um, but always elect it no matter what because that's an that shows at least that you're operating in good faith and you're going to try to resolve this with your supervisor or your manager. And, and often if you don't select it, then later on the agency will say it is waived. So I have had cases where a client has said, oh, I deferred. Uh, mediation. Well, I've gone back and the agency says, no, 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 you didn't, if you didn't select it, then you waived it. Um, and so we've had to fight to get uh, mediation back on the table. And most of the time the agency uh, will want to, and even, even if that 90 days has passed and the client or the employee shows that they have an incentive or a, a will or desire to resolve it, uh, sometimes the agency will, will put it back on the table, but it's not a guarantee. Right. Um, so. <clears throat> You go through the mediation process. If it's not resolved there, uh, the complaints the go, goes from informal to a formal stage. And that at that time is when the agency will assign an investigator. Most of the investigators now are contractors. Um, they'll assign an independent investigator to um, discuss with the client what happened, the allegations, and then uh, the witnesses. Mm -hmm. And after that, um, the client has to wait or the employee has to wait 180 days uh, for a resolution. If a resolution has not been reached in 180 days, uh, the client can go to district court, which is federal court, um, and uh, file their complaint. Um, they can, or they can request a final agency decision or an EEO hearing. So it's really up to, um, to the client. And really, it, there's no um, textbook answer for this. Depending on the facts, uh, the client may want the EEO uh, hearing, which is an administrative hearing. You go before an administrative judge. Um, and if that doesn't go the way the employee wants, the good thing is the employee can still go to federal court. Um, the final agency decision is, you know, just requesting a decision on the merits based on the record. Um, and I, th I don't think employees realize this. If you don't put things on the record, meaning you don't tell the investigator, you haven't told the agency that something happened to you, then it's not going to be a part of what the agency looks at when they make a decision. So um, we've had clients. Is that an informal compl the complaint? That's it given? should be, but you know, I've seen informal complaints <laughs> that have come back to me and the, the EEO counselor who did the intake uh, will take the allegations and put them in a complaint and it's nothing like what my client said or what I said. So the employee, if they're not represented, really has to go through that EEO counselor report to make sure that what they said is in there um, because that's going to pass on to the formal stage. And there are always places where you can correct that record. But if you're asking for a final agency decision or if you're going before the EEO administrative judge, you need to make sure that everything that's happened to you is in that record. And, and bear in mind that most of the time when employees file a complaint, they're going to be retaliated against. Um, in, in what way? Explain. Oh, let's see. Uh, I, like, of, we don't have enough time. Recent, no, well, a recent <laughs> example uh, was when a, an employee was told um, by his super. It was a supervisor who didn't want to promote him um, to a GS-12, and he. It was a part of his uh, his his grade. It was an in grade promotion. It was an 11-12, a GS-11-12 job that he received, and the, he was an 11, but he didn't want to get the boss didn't want to give him his 12, and he didn't want to give two other African American women. They're 12. And so this employee who is not black um, helped the other two African American women get their 12 and then, you know, got his. And the boss immediately started to uh, just do uh, micro, uh, micro things to him, like taking away his uh, ability to telework, taking away his maxi flex schedule. And he threatened to file an EEO co complaint and he went to his boss's boss. Well, the boss's boss said to him, to his face, I didn't get to where I am from filing EEO complaints. If you file the EEO complaint, you will be blacklisted. And at that, that point, the employee felt that he was backed into a corner and he went and filed the EEO complaint, but he did not want to put in the record that his boss's boss said, you will be blacklisted. He didn't want to put it there and he thought, well, you know, if it, I have a good relationship with my boss's boss and so somewhere along the line, I don't want to ruin, you know, I don't want to sabotage my career. Well. After he files the EEO complaint, uh, his boss's boss, of course, is, is backing the supervisor. Right. And, and the yep, that's his job. Totally threw him under the bus, and 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 now the, the client is saying, well, you know, let's go ahead and put it in there. And I said, you know, we, I, you can always amend. I said, but realize that. Uh, it, this wasn't a part of the original record. And the reason why he wanted to go back and put it in was because after he filed and he retained uh, an attorney. 
the boss um, actually made him uh, alter his timesheet. Um, you know, he just said, you know, you took annual leave this day. You didn't request annual leave, although he did. You didn't do it the right way, although he's been doing it the same way for three years. And he said, I, I want to take this off and you're not going to get paid for that time. And um, as a result, he lost pay. And we know that this is directly linked. Again, it happened after the EEO complaint, um, after we had notified them that we wanted to do mediation. Uh, so, you know, the timing was not coincidental. Uh, although, of course, they'll say it is. But those are just examples of retaliation. Um, and I, there, I'm sure there are others, but that was, that was a more recent one. And I said, you know, you need to expect this. And this is why people don't want to file. Yeah. Like, you know, now he, he's, he, people are like, they're just yeah, afraid. Like, like, maybe I shouldn't have done this. I, I shouldn't have done this. And, and well, now it's affecting my family, right? Because when you start messing with people's pay, mm -hmm. that, that's, that's when you're really getting to them. Um, taking away the maxi flex schedule and telework, you know, for somebody with kids, with young children, that really does hurt too, because they have coordinated pickup, drop off Indeed. with the spouse, or, you know, whatever. So when you put somebody, and this, well, here's another example um, that I just thought about. Um, with a client who was stripped of their um, telework schedule, it's a breast cancer survivor. Mm -hmm. um, actually, I'm sorry, they're stripped of MaxiFlex, which means you know you can come in at nine or ten and then leave later if you have a doctor's appointment, et cetera, without having to use your leave. You can just flex it out. Mm -hmm. And well, she was told, nope, you need to be here from 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. and you can take only take your lunch between 12 and 12:30. Well, she was in a staff meeting and she had already filed her EEO complaint and she was in a staff meeting um, and she got out at 12:10. Uh, her supervisor wrote her up for um, not adhering to the schedule, the new schedule that she was given where she had to take lunch between 12 and 12.30. She took it 10 minutes late and she was written up for that. Um, and that in the federal government, that just doesn't happen. Uh, right. So that was just, again, another example of them trying to create a record now to terminate an employee who has basically um, exercise their rights under the EEO process. Um, the, you know, don't be surprised if that happens. They will now nickel and dime you, scrutinize everything you do um, to create some sort of record so that, because it's hard to terminate people in the federal government. It can take a year, right. um, but they can only do it by documenting every single thing that you do. If you send an email the wrong way, um, you know, you're, you're on the line. Um, that don't be intimidated by that. Um, the federal government tends to be a very pro-management place. Um, the, the only way that culture will change is if people stand up for their rights. And most people do not. I think people get the sense that, oh, everybody wants to complain about being discriminated against. But the reality is most people are intimidated too, and most people will not ever exercise their rights under the process. They'll just keep their heads down um, and tolerate it as long as, as, until they retire if they can. Um, but imagine going to work every day and, and being miserable. That takes years off your life. Right. Um, and having a supervisor that's hell-bent on making your life miserable. We had a client uh, whose hair was falling out by the clumps. I mean, she would literally go like this and the hair would be coming out because of the stress that she was enduring by a very, uh, just a, an outrageous supervisor. And thankfully we got, um, probably seven or eight witness statements in favor of her. Um, but it didn't help her during the ADR process. I mean, the agency was still, you know, kind of, it, and let me just say, and just so people are aware, during the ADR process, most of the time, uh, at least for the, in the, for the Department of Agriculture, the, the mediator or the resolving official works for the agency. Right. So for the Department of Agriculture, it's very um, incestuous, if you will, that you've got people who are Forest Service employees um, who are actually resolving the complaint by this Forest Service uh, employee against the agency. Right. So, you know, you can say what you will about that process, but right. we've had some interesting outcomes from ADR. But the good thing is the employee can still continue with the process if ADR doesn't go their way and, and exercise their rights. And you usually when you get an attorney, um, you have a better outcome than when you do it by yourself. That's good. Now, let me ask you, if you ask for a decision, right, from the, make the agency makes a decision, the agency decides there's no discrimination. Does that impact when you go to court? Is that, is that introduced? That's a good question. Um, it's really, it's de novo. I mean, yes, the U.S. attorney or whoever's bringing the, uh, defending the agency at that point can, bring, can try to bring that up. But it's really, the court is going to look at it um, b based on the evidence that you present in, in district court. And you kind of get two bites at the apple because when you've gone through the agency process and you've collected statements and discovery 
jury or whatever, if you've had an attorney, um, for people that have gone through the agency process alone with no lawyer and they really didn't have the evidence that they needed because they really didn't know what to ask for, um, at least going to court and getting an attorney will help you. It starts over. You can now gather facts and gather documents through the discovery process um, that the trial that's you know um, put in place by the trial court um, to get the stuff that you need so that you have a positive outcome um, or at least be able to have the opportunity to present the best case possible. Uh, with the goal of having a positive outcome that you can. So I definitely think having an attorney makes the difference in these cases, and at least having that guidance uh, through the process. So thankfully you do get a second bite if it doesn't go your way through at the agency side, but it can take a long time for the agency to resolve, so you have to really um, have uh, some staying power, if yeah, you will. That's a good, interesting. Now let me ask you something. Now, you talked about getting a lawyer. Now, a lot of these things, some of these things you can do on your own, when do you advise that somebody should call you? Call, I, you know, the timing is so tight with the 45 days. Don't, definitely don't wait till the 30th day to call an attorney, you, if you can, or the 44th day, uh, because you want time for that person to evaluate your case and get back to you. I like for people to call me as soon as they think discrimination has happened, so we can do that merits evaluation very early on. Mm -hmm. uh, we can help you identify the key witnesses that you're gonna need, help you identify the key pieces of information. Um, but sometimes it doesn't happen that way. Sometimes clients have already gone through the informal process. Um, if we've picked up cases at the formal stage, um, but it's, it's a lot harder then because you're trying to get your stuff into the record uh, that's probably not there, what you need to present a good case before the agency. Um, but you know, it, it's case by case. We evaluate everything on the merits. Some clients are pretty good at having their information um, ready and available to us. They just don't know how to submit it. And let me just say that the agency's not going to educate you very well, other than telling you you have 45 days. <laughs> They're not gonna you know, tell you these are the documents that you need to have. So we always prefer for people to call us in the very beginning if they can, um, but if they're in the middle of it, it will always evaluate the case at that stage and see what we can do to help them. Now, what if someone feels that they've been discriminated against against others, like their performance evaluation is lower than others, but how do they get that information? Are you able to get that information? Well, it's, you can really, you can only get that stuff through discovery. Uh, so you have to know, you know, when people come with disparate treatment, that's what that's called, disparate right. treatment claims. Um, usually they'll, I always ask, like, how do you know this other person got, was reviewed uh, better than you, but they've been out of, they haven't even been in the office in the last three months. Um, and so we ask them, you know, how they know, well, oh, well, such and such told me that this is what this person got. And that's a little bit harder. Um, now, I've, I, now, I can ask, have you seen it? Most of the time, they're not supposed to see somebody else's performance evaluation right. unless that person showed them. Um, so it really depends. It's a case by case thing, because if you're sneaking around, if the client is sneaking around through people's personnel records just to see how they were evaluated, it's like, yeah, you really can't do that. Right. You know, <laughs> what, what you, that's probably something we can't move on. Right. Um, but, um, I think even a disparate treatment claims alone, you, you want to be able to compare um, you know, certain behavior, the way the manager is treating somebody differently from you. You want to be able to um, take behavior that's pretty obvious. Um, you know, if you're being docked, for example, in the case where I told you that the gentleman, um, the, the employer, the manager made him change the timesheet mm -hmm. um, for not requesting leave a certain way. Well, I asked him, I said, find out that same week who else requested leave and find out the manner in which they requested leave because they had an informal thing. You just sign the in, the in and out board they have up there and you're fine. Well, the manager's like, no, you should have emailed me and then sent me a text message. Okay, but is that an official policy? Is that written somewhere? Are other people requesting it just through the in-out board without texting it? That's stuff that you can easily find out from talking to people. Um, so that, that's just an example of disparate treatment that you can actually move on. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. Now, if somebody wants to contact you, how do they contact you? Who, what number should they call? Uh, well, they can go to our website, www.fordlawpros, and look us up there, or they can call us directly at 202-792-4946. All right, and if you want to see, check out more episodes or check out this episode or rewatch it, you can go to www.chatwiththelawyer.tv. And thank you for joining us.